Good morning. Welcome to the online gathering of Windsor Baptist Church. My name is Camilla, and this is my daughter, Carmel. Let us begin this service with a reading from the book of Psalm, chapter 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Advent is over. The Christmas tree lights have dimmed. The once wrapped gifts have been shared. But the awesome love of God still shines brightly in our hearts. Our spirits resound with the good news of salvation. Emmanuel, God with us. Let us pray. Lord of mercy and joy, you have given us the blessing of your son Jesus, who will make known your presence, forgiveness, and love to each one of us. Today, we virtually gather together, and even though not physically present in the church building, we are united in prayer. We can be filled with joy. Fill us up, Lord. Fill us to overflowing with joy. At the start of another period of lockdown, we, have done, we do not want to be filled with sadness or self-pity, but we ask you, dear Lord, to make your presence known. Empower us to be people of great faith who do not give in to fear. Empower us to place our trust in you, to build one another, to pray one another, um, empower us, for you are our only hope. You shall reign forevermore. Amen. Only few days are left of the year 2020. I am sure that uh, many of us look back at the end of each year and think, analyze, recapitulate, some call the year 2020 a year of empty churches. Church service, homily, corporate prayer, worship, moved to the virtual space. For me personally, it was rather strange at the beginning to watch church online, sing praises, pray, receive the blessing, stand for the public reading of God's word all in front of the screen. I guess uh, for me, there have been many lessons uh, to learn when it came to this new virtual church service arrangement. Am I a Martha, listening to the message while busy cooking or cleaning, or in any other way being distracted by the fact that I'm in my own home? Or am I her sister, Mary, sitting at Lord's feet, listening to what he says, paying attention. Where have I been this year? How have I been walking? Perhaps in the desert, when all that within me feels dry. Perhaps I have been calling to the Lord from the fire, in weakness, or trial, or pain. This year might have been harvest for some, or battle and triumph is still on its way. Our cir circumstances are different. Everyone has a different story, but there is one God that unites us, our compassionate, almighty God. Let us worship his name. The words of the next two songs offer reassurance. God is my victory, whom shall I fear? Let's sing together. Stop. 
As Kamala has said, this is the last Sunday of the year, and it's a time to reflect, to look forward, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that means for us as a church. As we look forward to the new year, there is so much about a new start in the coming weeks. If you haven't been past the building of the Majestic on Lisburn Road, it is looking fantastic and it certainly represents a very exciting new start. As we think about that, there's also last week's new guidelines, and I want to tell you a bit about what that means for us as a church. In some ways, they are worrying. There's almost like a blue warning light flashing down the road that for some people is saying, get out of the way, you can't do, go anywhere, you can't do anything. Well, our view is that we're being told Sunday gatherings for worship can still continue, and so unless you hear otherwise, we hope to be back here in this building in Malone Avenue next Sunday on the first Sunday of January. So please do keep an eye out. If government guidelines change, we will let you know. These warning lights are certainly a call for us to be concerned to be prayerful and watchful and careful, and we will continue to do that. And we're conscious this year comes to an end with many people very concerned and fearful and sad about all of the consequences of this. But as we look forward, we see God going before us, we see a new start, and we are preparing for all of that. The Majestic is due for completion mid-January. And we're hoping to have a soft start, as it's technically called, in mid-February. And we'll be sharing lots of details about that. But there is one important piece of information I want to share. As we prepare our hearts, as well as a building, we're going to introduce 40 days of prayer. That will run from mid-January right to the end of February. And so please do join us in seeking God in a fresh way, in laying before Him this new start, this new year, this new beginning, and asking Him to consecrate us and prepare us for all that He's going to do. God loves Belfast, and we see that demonstrating in the way He's providing this platform for good news. So, please do be part of that. And your part is vital. So, if you feel there's an area that you can serve in, whether it's, as you've heard in recent weeks, part of the AV team or in some other way, please do get in touch and let us know. Your part is vital as well if you need help, and we are on call. Please do contact us if you want prayer, if you want support for a particular need. That's why we're here. We'd love to reach out to you and to stand with you at this time. But as we come to the end of 2020, on behalf of the staff team, I want to say thank you for all of the ways in which you have stood with us, prayed for us, supported us, and we look forward to doing that together in the year to come. Thank you, Gordon. My faith is not just a private matter, not just God and I, not just an act of participation on church service, 
this being online or in person. It is practically demonstrated in love, in solidarity with um, other people. Who would have ever imagined that uh, you could show solidarity by simply staying at home? Sometimes we can bless others by staying at home during a lockdown, but sometimes uh, practically. And there have been many opportunities within um, our church to do so recently. Buying a Christmas hamper, donating to food bank, writing a Christmas card, or delivering Christmas cards in the majestic neighborhood. Praying for others, letting them know we pray for them. Uh, before David delivers the message this morning, we are going to give thanks and present our petitions before God. There have been many this past year who have been touched through different ministries of this church family. Let us lift those people up before the face of God. Let us pray. Father God, we worship your name. You are the everlasting, unchanging God, our hope. Thank you for your presence, for your guidance in the ministries of this church in 2020. Thank you for many volunteers who trust in you and were part of extending the helping hand into the community we find ourselves in. We are privileged to show your love and shine in this neighborhood. Thank you for many families who have practically been able to experience the warmth of the relationship with our church community by receiving a Christmas hamper. Bless these families and thank you for the established connection with them. We would like to see many more opportunities to serve those around us so we can truly be a church without walls. Thank you for the connection made with Solas and the blessing of the Christmas hampers. Thank you for many members of this congregation who practice giving generously, sacrificially, and regularly. We also pray for the Ministry of International Meeting Point on, Lis on Lisbon Road as they look at the months to come and how best they can serve those who have been entrusted to them through established connections and relationships. Lord, we would like to pray for those in power. The situation is evolving, unstable, fast moving, often surprising. But we know that our Lord is the same yesterday and today and forever. To you, Lord, we lift this situation and pray for our country's leaders, pray for world leaders, for wisdom and effective leadership. We pray for people who haven't found this Christmas time enjoyable, the lonely, bereaved, jobless, homeless, for families separated this Christmas. We turn to you and repeat the words of the song we sang earlier. Our God is a God who provides. Lord, comfort the sick, those who are dying and the elderly. Cover them with your wings and strengthen their hearts that they may continue to worship you. Namely, we pray for Sarah Ray and her family after the loss of her mom, Beryl, who passed away in Southport Hospital. For the family of Linda Murphy, we pray for Philip, Nicola, and loved ones. Help them to find comfort in you, in your word, because in it, there is healing and wholeness. Lord God, let your comforting presence be also known to Alistair Campbell, whose father Angus is critically ill in Ulster Hospital. 
Thank you for all the NHS and nursing home workers who have cared for Linda, Angus and Beryl and many others in these difficult times. We want to keep remembering these people in prayer and with thankfulness for their brave service. Holy Spirit, help us to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but rather lifting our eyes to what is unseen. Jesus, heaven, eternity, hope. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. We will now sing two songs and afterwards listen to the sermon by Pastor David.
Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Camilla, and thank you, Carmel, for leading us today. Uh, if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Luke chapter 7, and we're going to pick up from where we left off in Luke's gospel on the Sunday before Advent, which is over a month ago. As part of our Life in Three Dimensions series, going through Luke's gospel, thinking about our up, in, and out relationships with God, with one another, and with our neighbors, we had reached the end of chapter 6, and the end of that amazing and so-called Sermon on the Plain that Jesus had delivered primarily to His disciples, although it seems that others listened in as well. But as we enter chapter 7, I want us to pick up on and kind of continue our Advent series, Unprecedented, because in the fascinating incident that we are about to read and consider, we encounter unprecedented faith. According to Jesus, the person in this story in Luke 7 has faith, the likes of which Jesus has never seen before. Here's exactly what Jesus says about it. I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel, or in the New Living Translation, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. Unprecedented faith. As we come to the end of this year, the last Sunday of 2020, let me ask you a question. How is your faith? Or how would you describe your faith? Is it intact? Is it a bit battered? Is it strong? Is it great? Is it weak? Has it taken a hit? Is it fragile? How is your faith? Now, the thing about this person in Luke 7 and this story is that both of them are surprising. There are so many unexpected aspects to what we are about to read and discover. And I'll be honest, I had never appreciated or noticed much of this before. I thought I knew this story. It turns out I really didn't. And so, if you're able and willing, please stand with me as we read God's constantly surprising Word. This is Luke 7, verses 1 to 10. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, that's the whole sermon we had in chapter 6, the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was ill and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So, Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Please take your seat. So, as Jesus enters Capernaum, he's confronted with a crisis. A centurion's servant is on his deathbed, and Jesus is being asked to help him, or rather, to heal him. Now, although this is a tragic situation, it's not uncommon in the Gospels. Jesus was often faced with people in grave need. But what is surprising 
is almost every other aspect of this story. And I want to take you through as many as I can identify. In fact, I'm about to highlight nine surprises so that we don't miss the unexpected and so that we fully appreciate the unprecedented faith that Jesus affirms here. So here goes. Surprise number one. A centurion is seriously concerned about his servant. A Roman soldier of rank, of considerable rank, appears to have a heart for a servant. It seems that he's genuinely concerned about him, worried about him, and that would not have been the norm. It actually says the centurion highly valued his servant. It literally means he honored him and cared for him, which was really unusual. And so immediately, we begin to discern or detect something unusual about this soldier. Surprise number two, a Roman soldier sent Jewish elders to ask Jesus to come and heal his servant, and they gladly went. Somehow, there was a decent relationship between a Roman centurion and local religious leaders. Again, unusual. Surprise number three. The Jewish elders plead with Jesus to help this man because as far as they're concerned, this Roman centurion deserves help, which again is strange. But then you find out why they feel like this, and here comes surprise number four and five. Surprise number four, the centurion loves Israel. He loves the nation of Israel. Surprise number five, he built the local synagogue. The Roman centurion paid for and funded the building of the Jewish temple. This centurion is incredibly generous, kind towards those you wouldn't normally expect him to support at any level. So clearly he's at the very least sympathetic to the Jewish faith, if not an out-and-out God-fearer, as other Gentiles of the day were sometimes described. But either way, his love for Israel and his lavish giving of cash to build a place of worship for the Jews both of those things were incredible and totally surprising. Surprise number six. Having sent for Jesus and asked him to come, the centurion then has second thoughts. But not because he doesn't want or because he no longer needs Jesus' help, but because he doesn't think he deserves to have Jesus anywhere near him. In fact, it's more than that. The reason the centurion sent others to ask Jesus for help was because, according to verse 7, he didn't think he was worthy to even go to Jesus himself and ask for help. This man's humility, and remember, he was a Roman centurion of considerable rank, but this man's humility is striking and surprising. Surprise number seven, his closing message to Jesus. End of verse 7, the one he sent to Jesus. It's astonishing. He says, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Now remember, this guy had never met Jesus, never seen Jesus according to verse 2. He had just heard about him. But he had heard enough to believe. He had heard enough to have confidence in Jesus' power. He had heard enough to trust that Jesus could heal his dear servant with a word, by simply saying a word. This centurion's belief in Jesus was astounding. As a man of authority who was used to telling people what to do, and they did it, he recognized the authority of Jesus, and therefore he was convinced that if Jesus just spoke a word, then healing would occur. It's remarkable. Surprise number eight. Jesus was amazed at this man, verse 9. Now pause there for a second and take that in. Jesus is amazed by someone. Numerous times in the Gospels, you read that following something Jesus said or did, people were amazed at him or by him, but here, it's the other way around. Now, there are only two times in all of the Gospels we read that Jesus was amazed. Here in Capernaum, and where? 
Does anyone know? Good Bible trivia question, only there's nothing petty about this detail. If you've got a Bible, please turn to, to Mark 6, because it says here in Mark 6 that Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth, and the problem was he couldn't do any miracles there. And then we read this in verse 6 of Mark 6. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So two times in all of the Gospels, Jesus is amazed, once by a total lack of faith and once by the complete opposite. You see, to surprise Jesus was amazing. To amaze Jesus was surprising. Surprise number nine, maybe the biggest. It's what Jesus then says. It's the only recorded comment of Jesus in this whole incident, and here it is. I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Jesus is struck by this man's, this centurion's unprecedented faith. It, se faith. it seems like Jesus had never come across anything like it. And he affirms it. He highlights it. And as we read in the last verse, he responds to it because the centurion's servant is indeed healed. So there you have it. Nine surprising aspects to this familiar story, and most of them I'd never noticed or really thought about before. But as you reach the end of this incident, there's probably two main standout aspects of this centurion's faith that reminds us what true Christian faith looks like and how it is or how it should be characterized. And here they are. Knowing who Jesus is and knowing who we are. Knowing who Jesus is and knowing who we are. As we've said, this centurion never met and had never even seen Jesus. He just heard about him. But based on what he heard, he believed. And based on what he heard, he accepted Jesus as Lord. Look at verse 6. Lord, don't trouble yourself. That's the message he sends. This Roman soldier acknowledged and submitted to the authority and rule of Jesus in life and over life. Here is a prime example of what Paul referred to when he was writing to Christian believers in Rome where he said, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This centurion in Capernaum found faith through hearing of and hearing about Jesus and through the word of Christ, which he fully believed. And so he said, Jesus, just say the word and my servant will be healed. So I asked earlier, how's your faith as we come to the end of this year? Well, here's another good follow-up question. Do you really know who Jesus is? Do you believe based on what you've heard about who Jesus is? And from what you have heard about who Jesus is, how do you respond to him? Do you, like this centurion, acknowledge his lordship, submit to his authority, recognize his position, recognize his power? Knowing who Jesus is, do we know who Jesus is? Based on what we have heard, we haven't seen him. We haven't met him physically, but we've heard lots about him. But there's more to this because the second essential aspect of faith, of true Christian faith, is knowing who we are. The Roman centurion was very clear and aware of his own spiritual state and standing before Jesus. He was under no illusion regarding it. And so as we've already highlighted, he sent others to speak to Jesus because in his own words, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Plus again in his own words, I do not deserve you to come under my roof. This man was very conscious of his own unworthiness. There was no sense of pride or position, no sense of priority or place. He saw himself as he really was, and he admitted that he just did not deserve or warrant the help of Jesus. And this, this self-awareness of our own sinfulness before a holy God is essential to true Christian faith. C.S. Lewis put it rather bluntly and strongly. He, he said this, the true Christian's nostril is to be continually attentive 
to the inner cesspool. C.S. Lewis was obviously well aware of the state of his own heart. He knew what lay and lurked within. And unless we get that, unless we share that perspective, then our understanding of grace and mercy and forgiveness will be diminished. We need that mindset. We need that attitude of heart that echoes the so-called Jesus prayer that is used in certain sections of the church. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a story to kind of illustrate this mindset. And many of you will know this story, and it's the story that this Jesus prayer is based on. But Jesus refers to a religious person who goes to pray at the temple. And this religious person, Jesus says, stands up and says to God, look, thank you, God, that I'm not like certain people. I'm not like robbers. I'm not like evildoers. I'm not like adulterers. And Jesus effectively writes this person off. But then he refers to a tax collector who, although he wanted to, wouldn't even go near the temple to pray because he felt so unworthy, so unfit, so undeserving. And therefore, according to Jesus, he stood at a distance. And Jesus then describes how this tax collector looks up to heaven, beats his breast, and cries, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus hits everyone with a punch leg. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, so the tax collector rather than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so you go back to Luke 7, and here is a centurion Roman centurion soldier who is exactly like that tax collector in Jesus' story in Luke 18. He knows who he is. He knows the true state of his heart before Jesus. And it's that humility, it's that stunning self-awareness, that acceptance of his internal mess that proves essential to true Christian faith. And for many people today, they just don't get that at all and would never describe themselves in even those terms, would never describe themselves as a sinner. Or maybe what we tend to do is we we compare ourselves to others, the really bad and messed up in our world, the literal lawbreakers and twisted people we all know or read about, and we reckon, well, at least I'm not like them. And therefore, terms like inner cesspool to describe our own hearts kind of offends us. Sounds a bit extreme over the top. In some ways, we're exactly like the Pharisee in the story Jesus told in Luke 18, who stands up to pray and thanks God that he's not like those people. And yet the truth is that before a holy God, we are all, without exception, and without different bands of badness coming into play, we're all sinners who have the potential to really mess up. You see, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, as Jeremiah quite rightly declares. And the moment we think other ways is the moment we forget who we really are and what we're really like. I'm not suggesting we we go around feeling miserable about ourselves all the time. There is a balance to strike here. One extreme is totally and consistently ignoring our own unworthiness. The other is living life seeing nothing but sin everywhere. Kent Hughes, in his commentary on Luke 7, puts it like this. We must remember that while Christianity that ignores sin becomes sick, Christianity that sees very little but sin is a type of slavery. It is forgotten grace. It can be tricky to get this balance right, but at the end of the day, knowing who we are, sinners in need of the amazing grace and magical mercy of God, if we don't see that, then true faith will remain elusive, and we will struggle. The Roman centurion knew who Jesus was. Lord, I acknowledge your greatness. I acknowledge your power. I acknowledge your authority. I believe in you. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. But he also knew who he was, unworthy, 
undeserving of the input of Jesus in his life and in the life of his servant. And as a result of those two facts, Jesus commended his unprecedented faith. Never seen the likes of it before. And so as we leave this fascinating story with its nine surprises, I pray that our faith will grow in 2021 as we fix our eyes in Jesus and grow in our knowledge, grow in our understanding of who Jesus is. And we will never lose our sense of smell, not in COVID-19 terms, but in terms of our own sin, our own unworthiness, and our own need of God's help. Lord, if you were to mark my transgressions, who of us would stand? And the answer is none of us. But we stand in the grace of God because of Jesus. We have been healed like that servant, not from physical death, but from our spiritual deathbed. Knowing who Jesus is, knowing who we are, that is true faith. That is unprecedented faith. That is essential faith. That is the centurion's faith. And may ours be similar in 2021. Amen. We're going to close with our final song that says, All Who Are Thirsty. And it's an invitation to say to Jesus, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. So let's worship God together as we bring this service to a close. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. 
May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Yeah.